Okay. UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is Christmas. Now, Ed can't hear it. We had some technical difficulties. But behind you, what you hear is a Christmas version of the intro. <laughs> and you know what? I was able to hear it. You were? It amazing, yeah. It does. It sounds pretty good, right? It was kind of cutting in and out on my end, but I, I, I got the gist of it. I'm well. glad you got it because I was pretty proud of it. <laughs> Anyways. Way, motherfuckers. That's right. He's back. He's back. It's Ed, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He's back, baby. Play it again. I don't think I didn't hear it. I'm back, baby. He's back, baby. That's right. Pick that one out myself. That's right. It's it. Ed. What's up, everybody, how's it going? <laughs> He's back. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm glad to have you back, dude. It's almost Christmas. Yes. Are you ready? Oh, I am. Fucking ready. He's Holy fucking. Shit. <laughs> oh, indeed. Oh, shit, man. So, uh, you got twins, man, just in case anybody forgot who you are and uh, what you do. Edwin, twin wrangler and uh, radio extraordinaire, podcaster, all that good jazz. Philosophist. Philosopher. Philosopher. <laughs> that's that's right. That's right. So, uh... You sound like, from my end, you sound like you're in a deep hall, like in a, a cathedral of sorts. You should turn down your monitor just a little bit, if you can. Turn down my monitor. Okay. Just, a, just a tad. Just a tad. Because now, all of a sudden, I can hear myself. Of course, I couldn't hear myself before, but, you know, now. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Good. Great. Grand. Great. Grand. So Ed's back. We got a Christmas special for y'all. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Whatever. Happy holidays. Uh, however you celebrate, I hope it's going to go well for you. Uh, we're recording this on Friday. It'll come out on Christmas Eve for all you splendiferous folks. And then uh, for you normies, it'll actually come out on Christmas Day. But... Uh, it, it's wonderful. We are cruising in the stratosphere, baby. It is episode 107 of UFO No, your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians. Time to get elevated and talk about Santa Claus and the magic mushroom. That's right. The origins of Christmas and kind of where um, the origins fall in psychedelic lore. It's going to be a real spacey trip, folks. It's going to be great. I'm excited. Um so I want to thank you all for joining the show. We're in the stratosphere. Cruise about uh, about ninety two thousand feet. Ed, where are you at? Well, I was at ground zero, but uh, oh. I'm 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 climbing. I'm good. Climbing. Well, I that's mean, good. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> He'll be stoned for Christmas. Wonderful. For sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. Every day that ends in Y, but especially Christmas. It's wonderful. So uh, make sure if you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review. And no matter where you're listening and or watching, make sure and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to follow to catch every single new episode the moment it comes out, as well as you can click that link in the show notes, the portal to all things UFO know, to find merch, to listen, and to watch. And now... New way to support the show. You can buy us a Romulan ale. That's right. Just click the link in the subscription and we will toast to your honor. It's that simple. Simple. Five bucks. You could buy one, two, three, however many you want, and we'll toast to your honor. Uh, send a little note with it. 
Uh, make sure to check out our partners, Clarkston CBD Company for excellent CBD products. Scribed, a great audible alternative that I absolutely love. No credits required. Entire library is unlocked to you. Um, as well as Buzzsprout, if you want to start your own podcast, do it with my link and you get to do it for free. Uh, and then, of course, be sure to join the growing list of Tinfoilists, the Tinfoil Militia. Get ad-free episodes, rewards for tier members, chat with us directly over Discord, and access to live bonus episodes each and every single week. Plus, of course, every single bit of my loyalty. That's right. And every single episode is brought to you by the Tinfoil Militia, the members who support this podcast, and we'll be giving them a grand shout-out later. So stick around for that. But for now, let's get right into it, shall we? Let's get into Santa Claus, the magic mushroom. Of course, it's that time of year again. Christmas time. You got silver bells. You know, every time you go by a store, Walmart's uh, notorious for this. You know, having the jingle jangles of the uh, Salvation Army guy with the bucket. Just uh, making you feel guilty every time you come out of there without cash. It's wonderful. Uh, but you got those, you got the roasted chestnuts, and of course, Amanita muscaria. Are you familiar? I'm a what? <laughs> Amanita muscaria. Say that 10 times fast. Yeah, well, it's uh, difficult. But that, uh, believe it or not, is how a lot of people celebrate or celebrated, depending on uh, how old you are and you know when you started. But that's how they celebrate. And in fact, they would consider it weird that we don't celebrate it that way. Uh, because that's really what it was all about. And if you've ever wondered, like, why is Santa's suit is red and white? If you've ever wondered why the reindeer fly? If you've ever wondered why Santa goes down a chimney? Well, stick around, folks, because we're going to break it down like we do with UFOs and aliens and all that jazz. We're going to give it to you straight, and this is what it is. So if you're thinking magic... If your answer is, well, Santa can fly around uh, the world because of magic and he's reindeer fly because of magic and he goes down chimney because of magic. Well, you're right, but it's magic mushrooms, not the Christmas spirit that keeps Santa and his reindeer flying high. That's right. That's a little bit of that too. Well, of course, the Christmas spirit has something to do with it, but so does the uh, spirit of the mushroom. So both of them combined. Really there you go. Like, it's a combo like meal. Power Rangers assemble or some <laughs> shit like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. When the Power Rangers assemble. That's it, dude. That's it. They said they they form a mega lord of uh of Santa. That's awesome. Hold on, I need to turn you up, Ed. I think. Turn me up. Yeah, I need to turn, turn me up. you up. There you go. Give me a little bit more Better? tone, bro. Oh yeah. Yeah, there we go. That's perfect. I got you. Now you were a little you were a little low, dude. I want the folks to be able to hear you. Shit. So uh so anyway, so um mainstream history will tell you that Santa himself and his red and white outfit was designed by Coca Cola in the late eighteen hundreds from a massive ad campaign to sell their product. And that might be partially true as far as like where the the mainstream idea of Santa comes from. But the somewhat fuzzy origins, dare I say uh, hallucinogenic origins of Mr. Claus was prior to Coca-Cola, comes from Siberian shamans and the use of the mushroom... Amanita muscaria. Now, if you've never seen a picture of, Am- of Amanita muscaria, it is the reason they call it the Santa Claus mushroom. It is red and white. It's a big, um, kind of a shiny, round, very stereotypical mushroom style. Um, I was just gonna ask, yeah, like yeah. Mario and exactly. Like that. That's right. That's right. So very stereotypical mushroom style. But big red and white, uh, big red with white spots on it, stands up kind of tall. That's where kind of the idea of 
that comes from in ancient, uh, in old school Christmas time. So the most common Christmas traditions that we know of have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it actually predates Christianity, goes deep into, and a lot of people are going to know this, it goes deep into paganism, deep into Nordic mythology. And in fact, if you look at, you know, there's a big debate as far as where December 25th came from, you know, especially like in, in Christianity, there's a lot of arguments that during that time of year, um, they wouldn't have been doing what they were doing in that area. You know what I mean? That December 25th wasn't really the time. I mean, I don't really know this. I'm just saying that there's arguments that the time that they picked December 25th isn't from biblical accuracy as far as the actual time frame of what was going on, that it's based on um, the time period that was always based around celebration. When there was a lot of banquets, there was a lot of music, dancing, a lot of socializing. And the reason why is think about ancient times, okay? Ancient times were controlled by the seasons and the harvest. So winter's tough. It's dark. It's cold. It's extremely difficult. A lot of people died. So celebration was really required to keep spirits high and to stay positive during this really, really insanely difficult time of the year. You know, we look at winter like, oh, shit, we got to crank up the heat. We're going to pay more on our bill. But imagine running out of food. Right. You know, I mean, that that was the main thing, running out of food, not being able to stay. I mean, a fire can only do so much. And if you don't prepare, well, then you're fucked. So... With all that going on, they needed all the reason they could to be lively and celebrate. Excuse me, and celebrate. So, the harvest was brought in right during, um, like fall, autumn time. Right, cattle had been slaughtered because they've been they didn't want to feed them during the winter, so they fed them throughout all the other time and then slaughtered them when it came into the winter months, so that the way they had meat. Um. The majority of wine and beer was made during this time of year and was was fermented. I'm sorry, it was it was done during this time of year. So wine and beer has to ferment, right? It takes time. So what they yeah. would do is they would set it up throughout the earlier times of the year so that would be done and ready to drink by the time the winter came. So, in other words, that means that there was an abundance of food and and drinks. And so that's why they were all celebrating. So it was a very, very good time to celebrate and to hunker in, spend time, cut, you know, get the family together, warm each other up, all that kind of good stuff. So the vibe a good time to have an abundance of food and drinks. Damn straight. So the Vikings had the midwinter festival, also called Yule. That happened during or uh, in Nordic countries between winter solstice, generally December twenty first, and the Yola Blot, Yule sacrifice, which originally it's thought might have actually happened in uh, around the twelfth of January, but either way, you know that's not too far past Christmas. So again, this time was all spent with the Vikings. Feasting, banquets, games, drinking, singing, sacrifice to gods. And then you have the Romans who had the festival of uh, Saturnalia, which is an ancient festival in honor of the god Saturn on September 7th, or I'm sorry, December 17th and went till the 23rd. What were we going to say? I I just said weird. Yeah. I've never never heard of that god. Oh, really? I mean, I'm, I'm not very up to par with my gods and stuff, I guess. Well, here's a, the thing is, is all the planets are, are named after gods. Okay. All of them. So including Pluto, who's not even a planet anymore. Jesus. Anyways. Uh, but all this was going on from the 17th to the 23rd of December. And then, um, they celebrated with a sacrifice at the Roman temple of Saturn, then a big banquet. And then also they gave gifts. 
So all this, this is all way before Christianity ever came about. Or, well, maybe not before Christianity, but during that same period where it would have been before, I believe. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it was before the death of Christ. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure yeah, as no. far as that goes, but because the Romans and all that, that was all during that time, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff crammed in the, that little time frame. Yeah, exactly. So there was a lot of other celebrations, too, all throughout Europe. Uh, there was, you know, again, all the same themes. Banqueting, feasting because of the abundance of everything, gift-giving, human sacrifice, which is interesting how how human sacrifice was such considered such a, a, a celebrated thing. You know, like here they are like, oh, banquets and feasting and gift giving. Oh, and human sacrifice. You know, like all this stuff going on at the same time. It just seems so crazy. You know, that yeah. you would have death in order to celebrate life. But, but isn't that kind of the circle of life idea? It all comes full circle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, the also... Now, the the whole idea of mistletoe, where does that come from, right? Mistletoe and holly, that goes back thousands of years. There's a author named Peter Haining who has a book called Superstitions, and he wrote, and I quote, in many pre-Christian, that didn't even do what I wanted it to do. Hold on. Oh, dude, you actually sound better to me. Now, you don't sound like you're in a hall now. Oh, well, that's good. What do I sound like now? Uh, you sound like a, a basic bitch AI. <laughs> <laughs> basic bitch AI. Oh, good Only to like know. Only like a deeper, a deeper male voice. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's what I was wondering. What, what I, was I was trying, trying to, to do. do. Yeah, yeah, that, that does sound good. good. It's, it's I've, I've been, been using this voice mod thing. thing. I'm, I'm trying, trying to get used to it. To it. Anyways, oh, there there it was. There it worked for a minute. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's a very it, distinct voice. What's, what's that? that? It's a very distinct voice. The deep voice. It won't do it. Damn it. Anyways, I was trying to get to do <laughs> What I was trying to do is read this in a deep voice. Hold on. I'll get it going here in just a moment. Hold on. It is a deep voice. It is a deep voice, but it wasn't supposed to do it then. It was supposed to do it when I wanted to do it. It's doing it at random times, damn it. Oh. All right, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Okay. This is what he said. The, the mistletoe, mistletoe was, was revered, revered by the, by the ancient, ancient Greeks as, as sacred, yet superstition, superstition has, has it that the, the reason why, why it was so lucky to be kissed under, under it is that, is that the plant, plant once offended the old gods, who therefore condemned it to have looked on while pretty girls were being kissed. That didn't go as well as I deep. thought it would. That's deep. <laughs> it's deep. Never get tired of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That was, a, that was a lot. I just want to make sure it's... A, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, I just want to make sure it was... <laughs> Can you say come to daddy in that voice? Of course I can. I could say anything in that or voice. Or come to papa. Come, come to papa. papa. <laughs> I like, I like it when you call me big papa. papa. <laughs> yeah, anyways. <laughs> I've been playing with that one. So my whole plan was like read that. Anyway, so here, I'll read it without the voice because it may have been distraction. Uh, in, I'll read it in Peter Hanning's actual voice. The mistletoe was revered by the ancient Greeks as sacred. Yet superstition has it that the reason why it's so lucky to be kissed under it is that the plants, the plant once offended the old gods who thereafter condemned it to have to look on while pretty girls were being kissed. I don't know which one's better. Anyways. So he was, he liked to watch? Like, yeah, apparently, apparently the, 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 uh, the idea is that mistletoe was blasphemous. And so, uh, so it was an offense to the gods to do it. So it was like being a rebel. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah. 
Isn't that crazy? That is. Yeah. That is. I know. It's funny. So anyways, uh, in a lot of pre-Christian cultures, Holly was associated with the god of winter and also the sacred plant of Saturn and was used at the Roman festival of Saturnalia. Is it Nalia? Nalia? I'm not sure. Uh, and um, Romans would give each other holly wreaths and carry them around, decorating them with images of Saturn. So you can see how a lot of the Christian traditions, the, the, the Christmas traditions, stem from these very, very old traditions. Yeah. So it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's all in, what's funny is, like, Christmas now is kind of synonymous with Christianity, right? The birth of Christ, um, you know, all these things. And it's interesting how that it's actually, I mean, a lot of people know this already, but that it's actually very, very pagan related. Very much so. And we haven't even gotten into mushroom stuff yet. This is all just pre-history. Um, so crazy. then, what's that? Go ahead. No, that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Bizarre. Yeah. Now look at us. We're kissing without mistletoe. Exactly. Just locking lips with me. no reason. Yeah. That's right. We're all going to hell. Heathens. So the ancient druids used to wear sprigs of holly in their hair when they went into the forest to cut mistletoe from branches of oak trees. And um, they would do this on the sixth night of the new moon right after winter solstice. And then a cloth was held under the tree. So you know how a lot of people have those, uh, like, tree skirts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a cloth was under the tree that would catch the sprigs of mistletoe as they fell off the tree. Oh, convenient. So see, yeah, see how it all kind of has a meaning? It's like, oh, why do we put a shawl under the tree? Well, originally, it was to catch mistletoe. Because, because, it, and the reason why they wouldn't let it touch the ground, because at first I was like, well, who gives a shit? You know, I thought maybe it was the snow or whatever. But it's because it was considered profane to have the mistletoe hit the ground. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. You will catch that mistletoe or die trying. <laughs> or die. <laughs> so then the chief druid would divide the branches uh, of the mistletoe and sprigs into several smaller sprigs and, and give them to the people. And then the people would hang them over their doorways as protection against, get this, thunder and lightning. Thunder and Thunder lightning. And... Wow. Yeah. So now, you know, obviously now in today's age, we know exactly what lightning and thunder is, right? But then they attributed it to the god of war, Thunder, or uh, uh, Thor and uh, Odin. So it was not a good thing. And also, you know, I mean, sometimes it, it brought dis very destructive things. Like so what? That what, like, like thunder and lightning? I mean, besides well, like, that. Oh, well, that, named this one. No, just <laughs> well that's what I mean. Like, you know, like lightning might have hit something or someone. You know, right. I mean, think about that. If you don't know what it is, if you have no idea what it is, you just know that there, and sometimes you can't even hardly, like if you look around the sky, you can't always catch every strike, right? But you see it with your peripherals. Sometimes. But imagine... Yeah, not knowing what it is, how to look for it. Like, we know all these things. We take these things for granted. We know about the whole, like, you know, stop and count to uh, uh, three seconds or whatever in between uh, thunder. Yeah, to, to figure out how far away it is. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we have we know so much about storms, so much about thunder, so much about lightning that we take that for granted. But back in the old world, literally every type of environmental phenomenon, weather phenomena, was considered a sign. You know, so thunder and lightning would have been considered potentially like the gods were angry. 
because it yeah. does sound it does yeah. sound angry. Yeah, you know. Of course. But they would also do this to you know like warn off uh, other evils, of course. But um, thunder is God's clapping. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the clap of my ass cheeks is alerting the guards. <laughs> the chief druid. Oh, I already read that. So, um, it's also believed that they that the uh, the holly and the mistletoe that they hung over their doorways had strong sexual powers, and they boiled it with the bl- sexual uh, powers. St- it said say? strong sexual powers. Yeah, but strong sex, uh, strong seductive sexual powers, maybe potentially. Would, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. Potential <laughs> seductive, yes, indeed. I mean, it just says sexual. So whether it's stamina, whether it's like boner power, whether it's seduction power, who knows? But either way, it was strong sexual powers, and they would boil it with the blood of a pair of sacrificial white bulls to make the best aphrodisiac. So, again, this is mistletoe and holly boiled with white bull blood to make an aphrodisiac. That's rad. (laughs) It's sick, but it's rad. I mean, like, it's just crazy to think, like, where these traditions came from and how brutal a lot of this stuff really was. And no wonder our culture these days is too weak to even bring it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's, in fact, on the bonus episode that we did uh, earlier today, we, which is already out to Patreon fans, go check it out. Uh, we talked about ghost stories, like where ghost stories around Christmas came from. And it was really interesting to see how far back it went, this tradition of telling ghost stories and, and scary stories to kids to keep them in line. And also, there was just a lot of strange superstitions. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there still is. I mean, if you were to true. really break it down and think about it, I'm Very sure there true. still is a lot. Yeah. I was reading something the other day, and I don't know mm-hmm. if it's true, but there's one from, like, Greenland or maybe uh, Is- Islandic, uh, but there's a cat that wanders around mm. and eats all the, the people that don't wear their their Christmas clothes, like that people got for him, clothes that people got for him for Christmas. <laughs> That's they, amazing. You know, cattle, the giant cattle eat you. Dude, you didn't. know that was started by an old cat lady who knitted sweaters right. for everybody in the village and was like, my cattle eat you if you don't wear my sweatshirt. And they look at the cat, and it's like one of those really fucked up cats, and you're like, no, please no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's hilarious. You know that was created by an old cat lady. You know it. If you yeah. don't wear the clothes I wear, I make you. My cats will eat you up. Hilarious. Funny. Hilarious. Well, according to Anglo-Saxons, kissing under mistletoe was connected to the legend of Freya, the goddess of love and fertility. And that the legend has it that a man had to kiss any young girl who found herself under the mistletoe due to fertility. You can only imagine where that led to. A lot of crazy shit, right? Because some chick is walking by and finds herself under mistletoe, and all of a sudden there's five dudes just beating each other up trying to kiss her. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, that's a lot of dudes. (laughs) I guess it depends on the girl. But uh, even the origins of caroling, Christmas caroling goes back hundreds of years from the medieval tradition of wassailing. You familiar with this? I did not know. I'm not quite sure what was, a wassail is. Well, I is. always thought, okay, so Have in there's wassailed? a. No, I don't think so. At least okay. not while I was a conscious. <laughs> but it makes me wonder, like, um, it, there's a song. um, Oh, what's the song? It's a Christmas song. Off we go a caroling. Oh, man, what's the song? 
But anyways, I swear that they say, here we go a wassailing all about the town. And I always thought they meant waffling. And I was like, what the hell are they saying? Waffling up your town, motherfucker. <laughs> but I believe it's wassailing. And that that's what they were talking about. And I had it's no like idea. A mix between waddling and oscillating. Ah, wassailing. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with singing. No, no. Well, uh, maybe dancing. Maybe. Oh, know. okay, okay. Maybe. Yeah, here we come a wassailing. That's the name of the song. Here we come a wassailing. That's what I thought. I was uh, so as soon as I started looking into this, I was like, wait a minute, it's wassailing. That sounds so familiar. Why does that sound familiar? And that's because they mentioned it in the song. And I never knew that's the word they were talking about. Wassailing from a medieval tradition of Christmas caroling going back hundreds of years. And this is from a 1950s Christmas song. Interesting. Interesting. So, so same thing. Like I was looking into the whole Christmas hauntings and, you know, ghost stories and whatnot. And same thing. I was like, where did that come from? And it came from a Christmas song because I heard them say that they were like, uh, when we sit around the fire and tell ghost stories and times of the glories of Christmas long ago, I was like, why? who tells Christmas stories or, or uh, ghost stories around Christmas? Well, sure as shit, they did it. Hey, man, you want to go out back and do some wassailing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's wassail hard. <laughs> we got 15 minutes. Let's go out back and wassail real quick. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's right. So, um, so what it would do is they would, um, of course, go door to door, singing, drinking, uh, and they would toast to the health of the neighbors. So that's what it really came from is like kind of a blessing on your house type thing. So you'd have a bunch of people. That going around spreading cheer, singing songs, and then they would go to your house, and it was a it was a blessing on your house. Nowadays, it's kind of treated like a Jehovah's Witness. You know, like I remember uh, one year, my kid, uh, he's seventeen now, but he was in he was in uh, like second, third grade, somewhere around there, and the music teacher had a great idea to take all the kids out caroling, right? What was funny, though, is, like, they didn't apparently, like, forewarn any of the neighbors <laughs> to the school that this is what they were doing. So here you have 15 kids and a handful of parents, right, showing yeah. up at a random house singing in this day and age. And let me tell you something, dude. Not everybody was thrilled. Uh, uh, uh. Not everybody was thrilled. And it was kind of funny to watch people because there, most everybody that wasn't thrilled just didn't come outside. They didn't stop it. They just looked through the window and they didn't come outside. But like the other people, the other people were totally into it. They stepped out. They had hot chocolate. They were like, oh, thank you so much. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So anyways, it was really funny, really funny. But that's yeah. why I was like, maybe you should warn some people, you know, because people just don't go around singing at people's houses anymore. Right, that'd kind of be annoying for me because Max barks at fucking <laughs> Well, yeah, nowadays it's like there's all kinds of reasons not to just show up to somebody's house and start singing. Right. <laughs> you know? I know. We, there's Max crazy people at, going around, so it's it's just hard. Yeah. yeah. Max will bark at someone two blocks up, man. I won't even see what, I'm like, what? It's like the wind blowing? What are you barking at? <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome. So if they were standing on my porch, oh my, my. Yeah. God. Exactly. Excuse me. Freaking out. Yeah. That, well, that's my dog, Ringo. I mean, that's Ringo Starr would be expressing his vocals deeply if uh, if if we had Carolos out there. He'd be trying to sing with him. Except it'll all be one note. <laughs> He's ridiculous. He is ridiculous. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, so it was really a way of, like, uh, blessing your neighbors, you know. Okay. Um, and... It also goes back to fertility rites, again, dealing with fertility, okay. where villagers travel through fields and orchards in the middle of the winter singing and shouting to drive away any spirits that might affect the growth of future crops. Interesting, yeah, huh? I didn't know spirits went after crops. I mean, dude, spirits go after everything. 
You know, I mean, look, when, when bad things happen, what do you do? You blame Doug living down the street or do you blame the spirits? You blame the spirits. Guess, unless Doug's a real fucker. I, I mean, I'm sure he was, you know, but it's like, it was kind of a town thing. Like they all knew Doug was a fuck face, but nobody could really say it because he was like related to the Duke, you know? So everybody's like fucking Doug, you know? So what they would do is they would just go out there and sing it and shout through his crops and, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So all to do with ridding bad spirits, all to do with that. So the singing, the everything. So then you have um, from the 13th century around the year 280 AD, all of a sudden you have the figure of St. Nicholas pop up who was a 4th century Greek bishop and gift giver of a Christian community in the ancient town of Myra. And the story goes that he was brought up in a wealthy family, lost both of his parents as a young man. Oh, my God, he's Batman. That, oh, I was just going to say that. Dude, holy shit, it's Bruce Wayne. Goes all the way back. He's a time traveler. Who knew? Well, he's got all that money. What else he can do with it? Travel through the time. Uh, loses and both I, of his I, parents. I, What's that? I, I do have to say I've never seen Batman and Santa in the same place at the uh, same time. Ah, <laughs> Dude. Dude, you're totally onto it. Holy Santa Claus shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, I missed it, man. Hold on. Hold on. I got to play this. I got to play it. Hold on. You sound insane. Do you realize that? You should be medicated. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> We're just both throwing sounds out there. Um. So, yeah. So, he apparently famously is said to have helped the poor father of three marriageable daughters who could not afford their dowries to save them from a life of prostitution. The man dropped three sacks of gold down the father's chimney late one night, making him the patron saint of prostitutes. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, imagine this. Imagine you are a good-hearted, wealthy man, and you decide the first three people you're going to help be, it are three hookers, and he this he's just given the nickname all through time, the patron saint of prostitutes, because he happened to help three of them. <laughs> Hilarious. It, it had, hey, it, whereas, why didn't they, the patron saint of single fathers? You know what I mean? It could have very easily... He helped the dad. It's like, oh, no, he's the patron saint of prostitutes because the girls happen to be, happen to be, uh, you know, ladies of the night. <laughs> I always love saying that. <laughs> I love calling them that. Hilarious because it's like, it clearly he was doing it to help the father. Yeah, yeah. But he gets, he gets uh, the patron saint of prostitutes. Hilarious. Well, because what? Yeah, he's not going to get labeled after something like a dad. I know, right? I mean, wouldn't that be cool, though? Like, I, I would love to have, you know, the patron, a wealthy patron saint. The St. Nicholas is the patron saint of single dads. That'd be rad. It's like St. Nicholas it Cage. St. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is the, that's what we need to do. Just go to Nick Nick Cage and be like, dude, here's the deal. We need you to don the suit. You're you're the Saint Nicholas Cage of single dads. Fuck. So this is where now we get into magic mushrooms. Because I'm sure you're like, okay, dude, none of this has to do with magic mushrooms. Well, that's because that all lines up. Because honestly, like, the, the mushroom thing has a little bit to do with, with some of the main, like the colors, kind of the symbolism around it, you know, some of it. Really yeah. to do with Santa, a lot of it. Um, Makes sense. And the tree, of course. But the rest of it, the the wreaths, the fertility, the mistletoe, the, the banqueting, all that stuff is all based on just seasonal time of year and celebration 
and any excuse to be happy, right? So that's really where it came from. So here's where magic mushrooms come into play. And they've been around for, well, I mean, there's some arguments that say they're the oldest organism on the planet, mushrooms. I can believe that. Mycelium and all that shit. So they've been used for spiritual practices as well as recreational, of course, for thousands of years. Going back to 9,000 B.C. in North African indigenous cultures. And we know that from rock paintings. There was an archaeological image found on a cave in Tassili, Algeria, going back to 3500 B.C., detailing mushrooms with animated auras surrounding dancing shamans. And, of course, there's also a uh, well-known depiction of mushrooms in a cave in Spain dating back six or anywhere from six to 8,000 years. And of course, a lot of other ancient depictions around Europe. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, there was a study done recently, a molecular study done that proposed that Amanita muscaria had ancestral origins in the Siberian Beringian region during the ter tertiary period, 65 million to two and a half million years ago. Damn. Damn. Anywhere from 65 million to two and a half million years ago. That's, That's insanity. Crazy. Yeah. And then it spread to uh, Asia, Europe, North America. The Selva Pascula Caves in Spain show mushrooms. So, how do the mushrooms have anything to do with Santa Claus? Siberian shamans, what's it all about? Well, here's the deal. Siberian shamans used to dress to resemble the mushroom Amanita muscaria, as in red and white. And according to a lot of sources, female shamans originally wore red and white costumes with white fur, black boots, and hats. So it actually could have started as a female shaman. Wow. Right? So here, Mrs. Claus is just some housewife holding down the fort while Santa goes and gets all the glory when really it was shamanistas donned in their their best red and white going around uh getting people high as fuck yeah, you know, that's pretty nice i know right super nice cool to do. and to this day siberian mushroom gatherers go out in ceremonial red and white outfits to this day so i mean to me that's winds up but we'll just we'll keep going so, uh, Professor John Rush wrote a book, Mushrooms in Christian Art, and a professor of anthropology at Sierra College in Rockland, California. Um, they researched this a lot, and according to them, they say, and I'll leave the deep voice out of it, they say, Santa is a modern counterpart of a shaman who consumed mind-altering plants and fungi to commune with the spirit world. He continues, As the story goes, up until a few hundred years ago, these practicing shamans or priests connected to the older traditions would collect Amanita muscaria, the holy mushroom, dry them, and then give them as gifts on the winter solstice. And it gets wow. even better. So they would go and they would collect the mushrooms which grew almost exclusively under, take a guess. What do you think? Siberia? <laughs> no, we're talking about Christmas. Christmas trees. Oh. <laughs> yes, they grew <laughs> under <laughs> Siberia. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, so they grew under pine trees almost exclusively. So think about that too, where the whole you know Christmas tree thing comes in. And in a large sack, 
they would uh, uh, open the... Oh, I'm sorry. So what would happen is they would be getting a lot of snow in Siberia, right? A lot of snow. And typically they were yurts that they lived in, those circular... Have you ever seen a yurt? Yeah. 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 So they would... Because all the doors and windows were blocked by all the snow piled up, get this. They would, the shaman would, what do you think he would do? Get high as fuck? <laughs> well, yes, but then he would go down the <laughs> chimney <laughs> to, to oh, deliver okay. in a sack to deliver the mushrooms. So literally in a sack full of mushrooms, he would climb down the chimney because all the doors and windows were blocked by snow to deliver the presents that were the Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that is very crazy. And not only that, that, okay, so here, they would then hang them in bags in front of the fire. Hence, stockings. Right? So then, try doing that these days. What's that? Trouble. I said, try doing that these days. Uh, yeah, yeah. Johnny Law will come get you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To put a put a real buzz kill on your Christmas spirit is what they'll do. Fucking right. Law. You're like, I was just trying to be traditional. Okay. Yeah. You know, I the the. You know, just a quick little tangent. I promise I won't go off. But Graham Hancock has a brilliant speech about this and I can't remember the name of it now he does uh there's several of them after school I don't know if you've ever heard of that they're a great thing they do like drawings of um and they do like people do lectures and they do these drawings to like illustrate what they're talking about it's really fascinating but um Graham Hancock talks about the fact that in today's age humanity's consciousness and ability to expand that consciousness is under attack specifically by government and laws that restrict what you can and cannot put in your body. And so it's something to think about when we're talking about all this, you know, even though it's, it's funny and it's fun and it's, it's fun to look at. This is something so sacred and so special that has been taken away from us uh, by force to a point where generations don't even know the origins of Christmas, that to me that's really sad. Yeah. You know, I wish, I wish we were able to, like, experience something like this. Yeah, I mean, that'd be... I don't want to be in Siberia with seven feet of snow having a shaman have to sneak down in my chimney, but I would love to be able to get a hold of some, you know, Amanita muscaria or just some good mushrooms, whatever the case may be, and uh, and experience that in in a in a environment with family and friends and without having to feel weird about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be the hard part. It would be. It would be. The, I mean, because, you know, these days, I mean, it's especially on Christmas. Like you had mentioned, you know, you were going to be high on Christmas. Like uh, most people's families are not okay with that. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And so it's it's very, very interesting. But that's why I love the whole idea of this. But so then on top of all this, okay, then Amanita muscaria is actually toxic. Okay, so a lot of people don't know this. It can be toxic. And I'm not exactly positive about the process involved in, like, eliminating the toxicness of Amanita muscaria. So when I say this, I don't want people to, like, take this as a recipe because I have no fucking idea. But all I'm saying is, is that the thought is, the general idea is, that before... Um, they would ingest the mushrooms. They would pick the mushrooms, then lay them out on the leaves of the trees to dry them out. Hence, huh. ornaments on the tree. Yeah. Right? And of course, 
red and white. You know, I mean, it, it goes, it, it just is so synonymous with Christmas that it, it's just, uh, to me, there's no doubt that this is the true origins of Christmas to me. But I don't, right. I, I don't know. That's why I ask these questions because I really don't know. Um, but you can easily see how this all played a part in the Christmas tree, the decorations, Santa, the bag full of gifts, you know, all of this stuff. And we haven't even gotten in the reindeer, folks. We're getting to it. Uh, according to James Arthur, Arthur uh, and he was an author of the book Mushrooms and Mankind, he says, So why do people bring pine trees into their houses at the winter solstice, placing brightly colored red and white packages under their boughs as gifts to show their love for each other and as representations of the love of God and the gifts of sons of life? It's because underneath the pine bough is the exact location where one would find the most sacred substance, the Amanita muscaria in the wild. The most sacred substance, dude. Think about that. Think about... What that means, the most sacred substance. An entire people believed, and they were so in this belief that by any means necessary, including the middle of winter when you had to go down people's chimneys and shit, you still made this happen. Fuck yeah. It was that important. Keeping the magic alive. That's right. So... According to Carl Ruck, who is a professor at Boston University, reindeer are the spirit animals of shaman, including many indigenous people of Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and even parts of Russia. Is that why they're so magical? Apparently. So, apparently the Sami... Who the the uh, Sammy or Sami? I would imagine it's Sami, not Sammy, because that just doesn't sound right. But the Sami <laughs> who inhabit Lapland, which is apparently the northern region of Finland, uh, this is often said to be the actual geographical location of Santa Claus. And his elves, like where the North Pole is. So, yes. Sami. I I think I've heard that before. Oh, have you? Maybe. Okay. Uh, it sounds familiar. Okay. And apparently, reindeer yes. are a very important aspect of Sami culture. In Norway and Sweden, reindeer, it says husbandry. What is husbandry? Uh, well, uh, that's, does that yeah. mean marriage? Husbandry. The care, cultivation, and breeding of. Oh, okay. Okay, so the husbandry, the caring for reindeer, was legally protected or is legally protected as an exclusive Sami livelihood. And the only people of Sami descent with reindeer... um. These are the only people that can own reindeer. Isn't that crazy? That the yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, so literally the the chosen people of the reindeer. Is that still the case today? Yeah, to this day. Wow. Yeah. It's legally protected. So, why are reindeer flying? That's the big question. Well, if you take into account everything we've talked about so far, it's because dancer Even prancer. Them mushrooms too. That's right. They're all dancer prancer, oh, vixen, yeah. blitzen, Rudolph. They're all tripping balls on mushrooms. And so here's the funny thing. So there's been research in the fact that reindeer love Amanita muscaria, and that they deliberately go out and find. The mushrooms where they live, right? Right. So, and apparently, according to like research, it's because they like to be experience altered states of consciousness. It's not just because it's good. 
It, it does, it gets them high. Now, here's the interesting thing. For <laughs> humans, for humans, Amanita muscaria, a common side effect is the feeling of flying. So it's interesting that the legend of Santa's reindeer can fly. Right? Isn't that funny? It. We didn't do it to be cool. <laughs> That's we did right. It because it got you hot. That's now can right. you dig it? <laughs> That's right. So then the shamans and the herdsmen, you ready for this? Would drink the reindeer piss. Yeah. So think- so here's why. So apparently with the reindeer, they were able to eat. So I told you that the, the Amanita muscari is toxic. So humans had to take precautions in taking it, right? They had to dry it. And even then, I would imagine there was some oopsies. You know what I mean? Do you, do you think they drank it hot or cold? Oh, for sure hot. What, how would you prefer your reindeer piss? Would you like it chilled or um well, let's Maybe see. I mean, if we're talking about cream. winter time, Christmas time, I would love a hot cup of reindeer piss. Yeah. Especially yeah. chocked full of uh of uh flying reindeer juice, dude. I'm all about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. here's the interesting thing. Speaking of drinking piss, is that they would go and drink the piss, but the reason why is because again, Amanita muscaria can be toxic. Well, when the reindeer ate it, the process of their digestion, whatever came out in the urine, not only was more potent, but it did away with the potential side effect of being toxic. It's it's like a bong, man. Dude. It filters out all the bad shit. <laughs> so they would, they would literally drink the reindeer piss so that way um, they wouldn't get um, sick. Crazy. Uh, you know, there's a coffee that my dad travels uh, every once in a while, and he likes going over to Vietnam. Well, when he goes over to Vietnam, he gets this coffee yeah. that's been, uh, the bean itself has been eaten by a weasel and then shitting out because what? the uh, because whatever it does, the digestion of the weasel, it does to the coffee, it, it like strengthen, strengthens it and like, like makes it like, uh, it's, it's weird. It More changes po- the- sounds the, like. Sounds like reindeer yeah. piss. Right. <laughs> Sounds like it's reindeer piss. It's actually pretty good coffee. I've, I've had some. It's pretty good. That's what, I don't know oh, if wrong. I could drink coffee that I knew had been made from weasel shit. I don't know if well, I Well, I mean, they that. wash the shit off. Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> I'm sure they're very careful to get all the shit off the coffee. I have no doubt. But I'm telling you, if I drink it, the first thing I'm going to say is, this is a shitty cup of coffee. I just, I have to, you know, I would have to. Uh, So, um, there's a lot of debate, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. So, yeah, so the whole idea is that they would drink it from the reindeer piss, so that way it would take the uh, potential for it to be toxic out of it. And yes, they did boil it. So apparently they liked their reindeer piss hot as well. I think I'd be more of an iced iced reindeer piss kind of guy. An iced piss guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll take my piss on the rocks. Yeah. 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 I get Great that. Great on the rocks. Well, you know, I get it. I mean, you're a, you're a classy guy, man. You like the, you know, uh, st- shaken not stirred. Right. You know, right. I'll take I'll take my reindeer piss shaken not stirred. Oh my Maybe God. reindeer piss with like a, a wedge of lime in there. That might be good. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, just spice it up a notch. Hopefully, the citrus doesn't do anything to the Amanita muscaria. Ooh. That's what you'd have to be careful of. You never know. What if it made it better? Like, when you know, when you do mushrooms and then like drink orange juice, it's supposed to like. Oh, that's right. Yeah, in. that's a good point. It might just kick it up a notch. Who knows, dude? Interesting. Interesting. So, um, there's actually some debate if the term to get pissed comes from this practice of drinking reindeer piss. Be interesting if it was. Yeah. 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 Um, so apparently there's this, um, 
there's this guy, Andy Lecter. Andy Letcher, Letcher, I think his name is. And he spent some time with the Sami, who are the reindeer piss drinking folk that are legally protected to own reindeer. And hey, man, let them do what they want. Let them drink their reindeer oh, I, piss. I okay? agree. I'm all about it. Then do it. Drink it up. But he went and lived with them for a short amount of time. And he says, he says, according to him, this is his quote. I don't drink and I've never taken any drugs, but I took some when they passed it around. Well, you have to, don't you? They expect it. Anyway, I was high as a kite. <laughs> I can only imagine. Dude, I don't know. I don't know if I could legitimately do it. I'd probably become addicted to it like a, like a reindeer piss junkie. <laughs> I need my fix, man. Just a little, just just a couple of drops. You're chasing when, when reindeer you around. Reindeer's gonna be here, man. <laughs> yeah. I'll suck your dick for a couple of squirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so apparently, a Swedish prisoner of war in the early 18th century, uh, Philip Johan von Strahlenberg. Uh, nice. Oh, that's a very strong name. You're right. Reported yeah. seeing Koryak tribes waiting outside huts where mushroom sessions were taking place, waiting for people to come out and urinate the people. And when they did, it was collected in wooden bowls and drank. Dude, they were after anything that pissed out the shit. It was that good. It's crazy. Yeah. It, I mean... It, can we, can we is it is it still potentially a thing like can we still drink the reindeer piss Will yeah i would imagine you just have to get uh permission from the sami who are apparently uh very fond of the drink so you'd have to probably negotiate with them to get in on a a urinating reindeer before one of them did but yeah the first time is probably the worst right well unless yeah the first time you drink reindeer piss i would imagine it's an acquired taste. Being for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you're a seasoned pro. Your friend's right. a newbie. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's right. Um, so, apparently, the hallucinogenic effect of the mushroom, Amanita muscaria, could be recycled up to five times. And still be felt. So think about that. They would drink the piss from the reindeer, assuming it was from the reindeer first, and not some dude that walked out of a hut, but from a reindeer, they would drink it. Then it could be pissed out five or four or five more times and still be used. That's crazy, man. Damn. These people didn't even need water. So if... The reindeer pisses, and then I drink the reindeer piss, and then I piss that out. Would my piss then be? That's what they're saying. Like, this is what would happen. Yeah. Swedish prisoners of war saw Koryak tribes who would sit outside of these huts where the mushrooms were being ingested, waiting for people to come out and piss, and then they would collect the piss from the snow and drink that. So, yeah, dude. Oh, even diluted in the snow? Yes. Wow. Crazy. Like, it's that potent. That's unbelievable. I mean, God, could you imagine what drinking it straight from the tap would be like? Yeah, uh, dude. Yeah. You use that word tap loosely. We're talking about a reindeer <laughs> dick. Let's just call it, let's call a spade a spade, okay? It's a reindeer <laughs> dick, and you're you're wrapping your lips around it. Well... You might not have to if you're good with, like, your movement, depending on the, the fact that the reindeer is okay with you being right there within a, you know. But I would, look, I would imagine nobody's, you know, going around and locking lips on a, on a reindeer Johnson. I think what they're doing is just putting down a bucket. Yeah, that would work, too. That would definitely work. A lot more thrill in the first one, though. <laughs> a lot more thrill. <laughs> So I much mean, more not, not even not even for the dick purpose, but for the, the you know, the, the thrill of trying to like get it to cooperate and be like, well, like wrestling it. You know yeah. what I mean? 
Yeah. I only want to kiss your pee pee. Just let it happen. (laughs) I'm after the good stuff. Oh, hilarious. So, uh, according to some, including Jack Herrera, do you know who Jack Herrera is? Negative. He is a cannabis advocate. He has a strain named after him called Jack Herrera, wonderful sativa strain. He also wrote the book, The Emperor Has No Clothes, Wears No Clothes or whatever it's called. Yeah, big time cannabis guy. Anyways, he believes that Santa Claus was a mushroom and Amanita muscaria, um, also known as fly, ajaric, ajaric. Tippy toadstool, whatever you want to call it. I, I want to call it that. The tippy, tippy toadstool. toadstool. Yeah, I like that one. But to me, along with a lot of these other people, Jack Herrera, the Sami, the, you know, all these other people, it, to me, it's it's conclusive that Christmas is built off of this exact thing, this journey to find, collect, and give Amanita muscaria, specifically around this time of year that was really hard on people. They needed food. They needed happiness. Talk about escaping your environment. It's like virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The original. Yeah, the OG. Yeah. (laughs) But apparently Santa wasn't the only mushroom. According to a Oh my god, Santa. (laughs) According to Dead Sea Scroll Scholar and author of the famous Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, John Allegro, famously claimed famously claimed that Jesus was a mushroom. That Christianity was the product of an ancient sex and mushroom cult with the word Christ apparently being some sort of ancient Sumerian word that meant a mushroom covered in God's semen. Huh. Yeah. So here's the theory, and I actually got this from the Jogan podcast first time I heard this, and of course I had to look it up because you never know. Um, but that apparently these ancient tribes believed that rain was God's semen. Okay. And the reason why is because after it would rain, the crops would grow. And the way they looked at it is that semen brought life. Makes things, yeah. Right? right? So, therefore, this... Planting your seed. Yeah. Uh, anyways, fascinating. And so, anyway, so that's where that comes from. Um, People are all outside dancing in it. Shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? A very interesting love affair with semen, culturally speaking. Yes. Yeah. And personally. But. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, as you can see, the traditions of reindeer and chimneys and pine trees and gifts sack full of toys and presents under the tree, the red and white color of Santa. You know, if you're not convinced, then at least I would hope that you are at least intrigued um, by the idea that this is very, very possibly where our origins of Santa come from. Our Christmas traditions come from is from ancient Siberian shamanistic mushroom rituals. It's it's thrilling to think about that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Think about Siberian shamanism and the Amanita muscaria being the origins of Christmas. I love it. What do you think a Siberian shaman looks like? I've been trying to picture that the whole time. Oh, dude, like a like imagine like a a Christmas tree but wrapped in furs. 
That's what I would imagine. Like a, a guy that's like basically got a hat that's top that's pointy on the top, but kind of fanned out, but all made of fur. Lots and lots of fur. I mean, we're talking about Siberia in the middle of winter, dude. These people don't fuck around. Uh, it's not flip flopping. No tank top material. Nope. I thought maybe because they were shamans, they were like, fuck no, it. this is you run too fast, your nipples fall off type weather. Well, I'd imagine. Yeah. I wasn't there, yeah. but that's what I'd imagine. You gotta protect your nipples, man. <laughs> yes. Lots of furs, lots of furs. So, uh, that's it. I'm convinced. I am convinced that uh, that all of this the Christmas stems from uh, reindeer piss. All of it. It I, does. Yeah. I'm I'm just convinced of it. Um, and be hard pressed to convince me otherwise. Hard pressed, I tell you. Hard pressed. On another note, if you guys yes. know where to get any reindeer piss yeah. or just a reindeer dick in general, let yeah. us know. We're asking for a friend. A reindeer dick in right. general. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. A reindeer dick in general. Just just find me any reindeer dick. Big, small, I don't care. I'm down. Hilarious. Hilarious. So with that, folks, with that... I would like to remind you that uh, if you have stories, if you have experiences, you just want to reach out, you can call, you can text 208-477-1288. Leave a voicemail. We'll play it on the show. Also, you can email I want to believe 115 at gmail.com. Um, and, of course, if you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review no matter where you're listening, watching, Hit that subscribe button. Be sure to follow so that way you don't miss a single episode. And of course, click that link in the, I said click, click that link in the show notes, the portal to all things UFO know. Yeah, just click it. Um, Click that link and uh, you can find merch. You can find where to listen. You can find where to watch. And like I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, now you can buy us a Romulan ale. Just click that link in the description. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's what Romulan Ale is. Oh. Oh. Holy Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, all the links in the show notes. You can find that, where to get merch, where to get us a Romulan Ale. They're only five bucks. You can buy us as many as you want. We'll toast to you in the show. And, uh, of course, it would mean a lot to us. And, of course, make sure to uh, check out our partners, Clarkson CBD Company, for excellent CBD products. Scribed, my favorite Audible alternative, Buzzsprout, start your own podcast. And, of course, you absolutely have to, you have to join the Tinfoil Militia. And I got a new thing. Listen to this. I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil. Militia. Stop, militia. The tinfoil militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. Hell yeah, my tinfoil militia people. They are Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter, designer, tinfoil hat wearing, Aaron Rice, Jesse, you're better half, Ed. Yeah. Jet Life yeah. Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt. Morgan, and of course, our very own Nathan Boldly Gone Higby, who is out in the field collecting clues and investigating the missing case of Mike. And he will have updates for us. It's just, you know, during the holidays and all that, it's it's tough, you know what I mean, for him to give us updates. So, anyways, um, again, link in the show notes. Be a tinfoilist. Get merch. Join the cool kids. Ed, you have a what? podcast. I do. Where can do. the people find you? Uh, Strange Circumstances, brought to you by Red Tide Studios. Oh. Uh, you can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. Hell and I've yeah. got a Patreon as well uh, under Red Tide Studios. And, uh, yeah, I've also got a shop and stuff. Hell and yeah. uh, Linktree forward slash Red Tide Studio. Ed, yeah, you should send me that link. All links. 
you should send me that link and I will put in the show notes for you. Okay. So that way cool. the people can access you without having to dig too hard. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. All right. That's right. Yeah, I can do that. And then, of course, you uh, can my, follow. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say my last episode was about uh, criminal oh, children. Oh, dude. So. It was a good one. Really? You liked it? I did. I, I will. So, look, I have to say, man, I have to say, I don't think you need the disclaimer. No? I don't think so, man. I think, I, look, to me, to me personally, I think when people look for true crime, if it's not nitty gritty, it's not good true crime. Yeah. I, but, I did but, it because. But I children. get, of course, and I get what you're saying yeah. because people put shit on in the car. I 100% agree with you. So, well, so no, I mean, you know what? About, you're, you're right. Be the, it was the, about children. And so I didn't want people to get like. Oh, traumatized. You know, get, yeah. Well, people have strong feelings about children. And of course. I, I get it because I'm a parent as well. And yep. I just didn't want to. I wanted people to know what they were getting into before. That's a good point. It. That's a good point, Ed. It's a very good point. You're right. You're right. I just, the whole time I'm listening to it, I'm going, man, I could have done without the, 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 uh, the disclaimer. You know, only because I, I like it raw. But like you said, uh, not everybody's prepared for that. Yeah. So yeah. you're right, Ed. You're right. I just wanted to bring that up to you. But you're absolutely right, dude. You're a professional. What am I talking about? What am I talking about? Uh, so we'll be back next week. Uh, every Friday, we're going to be doing episodes now. Uh, me and Ed are going to try and get together at 8 p.m. during the evenings, potentially earlier. I'll keep you guys posted. But uh, otherwise, we'll have new episodes to you every single week. Make sure and check them out. And as I always say, oh, 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 and uh, before I say that, uh, I want you all. Oh, Ed, we need to tell a quick Christmas story. Okay. So what's a what's a Christmas story from your childhood that really you hold dear? Or or maybe from your own kids, like, uh, you know, since you have kids. Um, well... I'm always into starting new traditions because mm-hmm. I, I, I haven't really found that sweet spot with my kids yet. This is like the first year that they're old enough to like know it's Christmas and what happens. But like, so I haven't formed any of our own family traditions. So I'm looking to do some of that. Some of my favorite from my childhood would be like going over to my aunt's house where the whole family would get together when my mom was alive and stuff. And, uh, all the uncles would come over and cousins, and it was super fun. Lots of food. Nice. Go down to the basement, open presents. There you awesome. go. Awesome. Presents in the basement. Yep. That's where all the best presents are. All the adults would drink, and all the kids would hang out and play. And- yeah. There you go. Ours was, our family was pretty scattered, um, so we didn't get to uh, to, like, do a lot of family, big family stuff. But uh, we would go over to my grandparents uh, in California. I I hadn't seen snow for, like, my entire childhood pretty much uh, being in California. So um, didn't really have that many, like, white Christmases. But but it was fun, like, having family get-togethers and all that. One year, my grandpa, before he passed away, um, when we were kids, he was, like, Six foot four, 250 pounds, pot belly. He literally was Santa. You know what I mean? Had the beard, the whole thing. And so um, when I was little, little, when we'd go over there, uh, like, you know, 20, 30 minutes into the kids opening presents, he would show up through the back door um, in his Santa suit. And it would just, all the kids would go crazy. We'd all go nuts. And because he just looked like Santa, man. I mean, with the glasses, everything. He he was it was he he did a phenomenal job. And so, anyway, super cool. And uh, so, anyway, so that's why. And then, of course, my own kid. You know, just like um, I told this on the bonus episode. I'll tell it again because I love it. Uh, one of my most favorite memories with Michael. I mean, we've had a lot, but it hit, uh, at the time I was devastated because I got him. Like to me, back in the day, because I was a single dad, broke as a joke, a hundred bucks to spend on my kid was a lot, you know, come yeah. Christmas time. And, but I would save up for it. Wasn't very responsible. So it's not like I couldn't save. I just didn't. But, anyways, uh, 
so I bought him this hundred dollar like ride on fire truck thing. Noises, the whole works, dude. It was legit. And we open it, he opens it up, and while me and my parents are putting the thing together, he's playing in the box. And when we got it put together, he could have cared less about the toy. He he literally played in that box all day. All day, Christmas Day, played in that that box. Never sat on the toy once. And I was devastated, dude. I was devastated. Because I was like, you know, it was everything to me. Everything to me. Oh, he's going to love it. He's going to love it. I put so much pressure on the gift. Um, didn't even sit on it the whole day. It took him two whole well, days to even sit on it. It's hard to compete with a box, man. Boxes are pretty fun. Dude, I'm still I'm still a fan of box. Like, yeah, yeah. And you, <laughs> it, I used to fold them up and, like, slide down the stairs. Well, yeah. Oh, I mean, I was talking about something else. But, yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, I know. I used to fold that up, too, and write it down the stairs. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christmas time. It's wonderful. Well, everybody... I hope you have a phenomenal Christmas, a wonderful, very happy time of the year. Happy Christmas. And, Ed, so I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yes. Merry yes. fucking Christmas. Thank you. Thank a you. Happy Festivus for the rest of us. That's right. Happy Solstice, whatever you celebrate, all that good jazz. And, of course, like I always say, remember to stay elevated. Keep your eyes to the skies because Santa's coming. And also, watch out for the government. They're shoisty bastards. Oh!